I'd like to uh, introduce our first speakers. We've got a tag team this morning. I think you're really going to enjoy. The first course is short and long-term effects of anti-resorptive agents around dental implants. The speakers are Dr. Jim Rutkowski and um, his good friend, Dr. Shanker Iyer. Uh, Dr. Rutkowski is a dentist with a PhD in pharmacology who has authored multiple textbook chapters and papers in peer-reviewed journals. He is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Oral Implantology, a past president of the American Board of Oral Implantology, Implant Dentistry, and an honored fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He lectures nationally and internationally on pharmacology, sedation techniques, bone grafting materials and techniques, and methods for treating medically compromised dental patients. So you can tell he's a smart guy. He has received the Gershoff Goldberg Award for service in the field of implant dentistry and the Isaiah Liu Memorial Research Award for contributions to research in the field of implant dentistry. Uh, Dr. Shanker Iyer is director of Malo Smiles USA, and he is the director of that program, as I said, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a clinical assistant professor at Rutgers University School of Dental Medicine in Newark, and an adjunct faculty member at the Roseman University of Health Sciences College of Dental Medicine. He is a past president of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology. He is the director of the AAID Implant Maxi course held in Asia with centers in Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, New Delhi, Bangalore, and Sri Lanka. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, and the Greater New York Academy of Prosthodontics. We have two really wonderful, gifted, and knowledgeable speakers for you. Gentlemen, it's up to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and the kind words. And I would like uh, Dr. Ira and I want this to be a good program for you this morning. We want this to be an hour where you get things that help you in your practice and essentially keep you from getting in trouble. Uh, you're going to have lots of patients in your practice as the population ages and they have disease states such as osteopenia, osteoporosis, or some metastatic cancer diseases where they will take these anti-resorptive drugs such as uh, bisphosphonates and monoclonal antibodies. Um, I uh, just have a quick question. I am trying to advance the slides and let's see. Ah, now they're advancing for me. Thank you so much. So the short and long-term effects of these anti-resorptive agents around dental implants. We have a lot of information to give to you in a short period of time. So what we will be doing is we're making our slides available to you in a PDF format. So if you want to do a screenshot or take your phone out and take a picture of this, but if you go to www.rutkowskiseminars.com forward slash access forward slash and fill out the information, getting a username and a password, um, and that, that's important for you to have that. Then you log in, you put in the course title, that's DPR 2021, the course date, 8 slash 13 slash 2021. And then this is an important portion for you here, the course access code, which is DPR 2021. That is all lowercase and with no spaces. Then you will get access to the slides so that when we're done with this presentation, you can go back and review them uh, at your leisure. There is also a consent form that is provided to you that will be beneficial for when you're treating patients that do take these anti-resorptive drugs and you're going to do a procedure, we believe you should have an informed consent because whether you're going to come down that the patient's gonna be afflicted with osteonecrosis of the jaw related to them having a history or currently taking these medications, that you should have a consent form in place to, uh, for your own protection. So the indications for these anti-resorptive medications are listed there for you. And you can see the big ones are osteopenia, osteoporosis, uh, as well as metastatic bone disease and multiple myeloma, and even patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they will be taking these uh, medications. 
Now, there's two classes of the anti-resorptive medications that concern us. One is the bisphosphonates. These are often oral medications that patients will take, and they are done on a weekly basis. And they, instead of doing them daily, they're done weekly because they're very irritating to the stumping. So they will have the patient uh, take them just once a week instead of daily to minimize the irritation to the stomach. They can also be given intravenously uh, for osteopenia, osteoporosis, and when they are, they are usually given on a yearly basis. The second group of medications that are of interest to us are the monoclonal antibodies. They are given as subcutaneous injections twice a year. We're going to first look at the bisphosphonates. The bisphosphonates, there's three generations. The first generation was didronel, uh, edadronate, and that did not contain a nitrogen atom to it. No nitrogen in the first generation didronel. It was not very effective at uh, reducing uh, the risk of osteopenia osteoporosis but we had absolutely no cases ever reported with patients taking didronel and having osteonecrosis of the jaw. But because they were so ineffective, they came out with the second generation. The second generation does contain nitrogen and they are 10 to 100 times more potent than the first generation. We do have multiple reports of patients taking these medications and have an inciting event such as the extraction of a tooth or the placement of a dental implant, but a surgical procedure or something that would cut the gingival tissue that now had to heal and it would not heal. We have multiple reports of that with these medications. The second generation are usually oral medications. When they take the oral medication, they have to take it on an empty stomach. If they take it with food in the stomach, they get absolutely no absorption of the drug. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these drugs are very irritating to the stomach. So if the patient, because it's bothering their stomach, they take it with some crackers or some toast the once a week when they are taking it, they get absolutely no absorption and you have no risk of getting osteonecrosis of the jaw when you do a surgical procedure on these patients if they did not take them on an empty stomach. Studies have shown that of all the medications, the bisphosphonates taken on a weekly basis need to be taken on an empty stomach are the ones that are least likely to be taken as they should be. So we have a lot of patients that have taken these drugs for 10 or 15 years, but they took them with food in their stomach, got absolutely no absorption. If, if they took the medications on an empty stomach like they should, they have to uh, take them with eight ounces of water and they have to remain upright. Because if they lay down, there, it's a very acidic drug. There can be a washing of the, uh, the, the stomach contents containing the bisphosphonates, such as Fosamex, back up the esophagus, causing esophageal varices, as well as esophageal cancer. So these drugs have some real toxicities to them. On the empty stomach, they get 3% absorption. So if they took 70 milligrams once a week on an empty stomach with eight ounces of water, they would absorb 2.1 milligram. That 2.1 milligram only goes to areas of active bone turnover, which we know is always the spine, which is the hip, the subtracanal of the femur, as well as the ankle. Does it go to the jawbone? Well, that depends on the health of the patient. If they have a stable occlusion and no inflammation, no periodontal disease, gingivitis or periodontitis or periimplantitis, perimucositis, then they're gonna have very little of the drug going to the bone. It's where the drug goes that it causes the problem. So you have a, a good stable occlusion, they take the drug as they should, very little bone is, very little drug is going to go to the jaw bones. But if they have active periodontal disease or an unstable occlusion, missing teeth, now they have active bone turnover, the drug will go there and that's when it becomes a problem for us. The third generation is 10,000 times more potent than the first generation. So it's 100 to 1,000 times more potent than the second generation. These drugs are often given IV, and that'd be the zolendronic acid, the zometa, and the uh, risendronate, the actinel. 
These drugs, when given IV, they are more potent and they get a 100% blood level. So patients who take the third generation, they are more apt to reach a toxic level of these drugs in the bone that's been turning over. And thus they have a much um, greater instance of osteonecrosis in the jaw. So we're looking at something that gives a higher blood level because it's administered IV and something that is far more toxic force. The monoclonal antibody is used for bone anti-resorption, are denosumab, that's Prolia, and Exgeva, and there's a brand new one out called Avenity. These do not build up in the bone like the bisphosphonates do. They do not have a long half-life. And we thought when these drugs came to market that the osteonecrosis of the jaw would go away. But in fact, we find that it is just as severe with monoclonal antibodies as is or as are the bisphosphonates. Now, the way these medications work for you is bisphosphonates, they interfere with the osteoclast putting out cathepsin K. Cathepsin K is what is responsible for breaking down the bone, freeing up the bone morphogenic proteins in that bone. Those BMPs then take the mesenchymal stem cells induce them to proliferate and differentiate into osteoblasts. Those osteoblasts then will lay down new bone mineral matrix. So the beginning of the bone remodeling process, whether we put a dental implant in or whether it's just daily living in the life, always involves the osteoclast initiating it by putting out cathepsin K, a very strong acid. It's like uh, got a pH of one. It's like concentrated hydrochloric acid. The monoclonal antibodies, what they do is they interfere with the rank ligand, and that is a compound put out by the osteoblasts that induce pre-osteoclast to mature into osteoclast that will eventually put out cathepsin K. So both of these drugs interfere, interfere with the action of bone remodeling by interfering with osteoclasts. One prevents the osteoclasts from putting out the cathepsin K, that is the bisphosphonates. The other one interferes with the maturation of the osteoclast, that's the monoclonal antibodies. Um, my slide's not advancing. Oh, very good. Thank you so much for your help there, I appreciate it. Now, bisphosphonates and monoclonal antibody benefit, that is the problem. The benefit is that it interferes with bone breakdown by interfering with osteoclast activity. The problem is that it interferes with bone breakdown by interfering with osteoclast activity. So what happens is when we, we, we just initially begin to take these drugs, sure, we're interfering with the bone breakdown a little bit, but we still have bone there that's got vital cells in it that is working. But when you continue to take the drugs and you suppress the initiation of bone turnover, on a daily or weekly basis with these drugs, whether they're given weekly or whether they're by injection once a year or twice a year, the action of those drugs continues on and you interfere with it long enough, now you shut down the bone remodeling process. So bisphosphonates, such as alindronate and risendronate, they effectively reduce hip fracture risk. And then the, the patient population is just not about what their dentistry is, it's about their whole lifestyle. And as people age and as they become postmenopausal, where they no longer have estrogen, their natural estrogen keeps the bone remodeling process going for you. But once they go through menopause, they no longer have that estrogen and they begin to develop osteopenia and osteoporosis. So then physicians naturally put them on these drugs. And we do know from studies that this does actually work. We know that it works. Long-term alindronate may inhibit the long-term repair of micro damage arising from severe suppression of bone turnover, SSBT. Every day, every one of us gets microfractures in our bone, whether it be in the hip or the subtracanter or the femur or the spine or the bone around that dental implant. 
When you bite on a tooth, you bite on a hard nut and against a natural tooth, we all know you've got that periodontal ligament that is a shock absorber. But when we have a dental implant, there is no shock absorber because there's osseointegration of the implant in the bone. So bite on the hard nut and you get a micro fracture in the bone. There is normal daily repair of that micro fracture that occurs due to cytokines such as PGE2 and whatnot. But if we take these drugs, these anti-resorptive drugs long enough, we inhibit the ability of the bone to repair. So we get severe suppression of bone turnover. The result is an accumulation of micro damage. This uh, process will lead to brittle bones and the occurrence of unexpected stress fractures, characteristic of the subtracanter of the femur or around our dental implants. Now, a large scale study suggests that for most women, discontinuation of alendronate after five years for up to another five years of discontinuation does not significantly increase fracture risk. So we know now that these drugs should probably be taken for five years and then go off them and maybe monitor to see how their osteopenia osteoporosis is doing. The problem is that there's confusion in medicine as to what is the real number. Some people believe it's as little as two and a half years. Some people believe that it can be as high as long as forever and there's not ever a problem. But the issue is, is do we stop it at two and a half years? Do we stop it at five years? Or do we never stop the drugs and we just keep taking them? And we need to get the um, medical profession to have an understanding there. So atypical implant fractures and long-term oral bisphosphonates, is it more than just osteonecrosis? Is there something else going on here that we need to be aware of? Can you go ahead and play the NPR for us now, please? Audio. On a Monday morning, it's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. Today in Your Health, we'll hear about an experimental device that translates movements of the face into computer-generated speech. But first, we're going to hear about a problem that affects millions of older women with osteoporosis, a common disease that makes bones brittle. For 15 years now, women have been able to take drugs that fight osteoporosis and prevent fractures. But in the last couple of years, specialists have begun to worry that long-term use of these same medications may actually cause an unusual kind of fracture. Here's NPR's Richard Knox. Jennifer Schneider was one of the first women to suffer one of these nasty, unusual fractures. Or at least her case was one of the first reported in a medical journal. I could hear it and I could feel it. I knew it was broken instantly. It was her right leg. It happened when she was riding a subway train in New York City. As the train approached a station, it jolted, and I shifted my weight from one leg to the other, and I felt my leg cracking. Schneider's thigh bone had snapped in two, just at the part that's usually the strongest. I could not understand how this possibly could have happened from standing on a train. Surgeons installed a metal rod to hold her shattered thigh bone together, but after many months, the bone just wasn't healing. Now, Schneider is a doctor herself, and one of the things she started suspecting was an osteoporosis drug she'd been on for seven years. It's called Fosamax. It works by slowing down bone metabolism, the building of new bone that doctors call turnover. Since you need bone turnover in order to heal a fractured bone, continuing to take this drug might in fact inhibit bone healing. So Schneider decided to stop taking Fosamax, and eventually the fracture healed. But after two years off the drug, tests showed her bones were thinning, and doctors urged Schneider to go back on Fosamax. I did go back on it, and within a year, I had a stress fracture of a metatarsal, which is a bone in the foot. And so I stopped the drug and never went back to it. Schneider decided to write herself up as a case report in the journal Geriatrics. Her report challenged the idea that women should keep taking these drugs for the rest of their lives. When Schneider wrote that five years ago, many doctors scoffed at her claim that the drug was responsible. But last week, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a large study done in Canada that suggests long-term use of these osteoporosis drugs does raise the risk of unusual thigh bone fractures. In fact, women who'd been on the drugs more than five years had nearly three times higher risk. Dr. Gillian Hawker of St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto worked on the study. Although the number of fractures of these unusual fractures was pretty small, they were pretty rare, 
it nonetheless did show a relationship with longer-term use. Pretty rare, but since tens of millions of women are on the drugs, the study suggests that thousands of them may suffer these devastating fractures every year. But here's the dilemma. Many women need these drugs because they really do work to prevent regular hip fractures caused by osteoporosis. Hip fracture is a horrible, horrible event, period. Very, very devastating and often an end-of-life event. So the drugs are necessary, but Hawker says not all older women should be treated. You know, I'm in my early 50s, and my mother and all my friends' mothers have horrible osteoporosis, multiple fractures, and that is really preventable in 2011. That's wonderful. But in the heyday of the early days when we all got excited about these medications, I think a lot of people who really probably didn't need to be on them went on them. Schneider, the doctor who broke her leg on the subway, says she's one of those women. When the drugs were first approved, many doctors thought women would be better off if they started on an osteoporosis drug before developing serious bone loss. Schneider began taking Fosamax on the basis of a bone density scan that showed some age-related thinning, but not enough to be called osteoporosis. Now she thinks that was a mistake. We should not be so ready to put patients on these drugs as soon as their bone density starts dropping. A growing number of experts agree. Dr. Cliff Rosen at Maine Medical Center in Portland says now specialists are worried about the risk of unusual thigh bone fractures. These kind of fractures, which, you know, are uncommon, but we've all seen them, now raises this specter that, gee, you know, we really need to rethink who we treat, when we treat, and how long we treat. There's evidence that five years on these drugs may be good enough to prevent regular osteoporosis fractures, and taking a break at that point may be a good idea. Rosen says the take-home message is, don't start one of these drugs too early. Wait until you actually have osteoporosis. And once you start, don't stay on it too long. Richard Knox, NPR News. And the take-home message for us in dentistry is, is that we depend on bone in implant dentistry. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to make an incision. We're going to do an inciting event on these patients. We're going to expose that bone. And then we're going to do an osteotomy. We're going to place an implant or do a bone graft. And if these patients have been on these medications for a prolonged period of time, five years or more, and again, some people say two and a half years at that point, we may not get healing of that bone. Sure, you might be able to go in and do an osteotomy and get initial stability of the implant but the implant may not osteointegrate effectively for you because it is going into dead bone. When people take these drugs for a prolonged period of time, you induce apoptosis to the osteoclast, the osteoblast, the osteocytes, and any angioblasts that are in the bone. And so now you end up with a bone that looks nice on an x-ray, but it is not living. And that becomes the problem for us in implant dentistry. Um, may you advance to the next slide there. Uh, and let's go to the next slide again. Okay, so um, uh, go ahead and advance one slide, please. Very good, thank you. The report of a task force, the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, showed that there are subtrochanic fractures nil or, or, or minimal bone uh, trauma will induce these things, tendency for them to occur bilaterally, prodromal pain and long, may occur with long-term bisphosphonate therapy for. So you're just essentially stopping the bone turnover, which results in killing the bone. The bone is there because there is a inorganic portion of it there that just holds it, but it is not living bone. Next slide, please. So the FDA recommendation are consider your pre- periodic reevaluation need for continued bisphosphonate or monoclonal therapy, particularly in patients who have been treated for over five years. Report adverse events to the FDA so we can start to see how these things really occur, and they are so often unreported. And anecdotal recommendations are that we get bone turnover markers, which I'll talk more about. Next slide, please. So could long-term bisphosphonate or monoclonal antibody treatment impact implant dentistry as well? I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ira, and if you'll talk about the effects of this on our implant dentistry. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate uh, the introduction. Well, we all are focusing on this technology and this is a technology summit, 
but technology will only work if the biology is understood. We were very concerned with branch when they were being used for treating cancers and reports were uh, refused in terms of what these bisphosphonates were doing post extraction. So we were focusing more on bone healing and extraction sockets. So could this bisphosphonates further affect dental implants or the bone that's going to support the dental implants? So when we look at the uh, physiology of remodeling around bone, bone responds to stimuli. You all are aware of Wolf's law, a change in the internal architecture and the external form of the bone is directly proportional to the functional forces placed upon it. So the more functional forces that are transmitted to the bone, the bone receives these stimuli and then wants to turn over and that's basic bone physiology. Um, Jim talked about creating microfractures. We'll talk about how these are really being evolved. So when we talk about bone physiology, bone is not a static entity. This tissue is very dynamic. You look at the strength, we are able to load the bone because of the stiffness that is afforded by all the trabeculation. It is also tough and you can see the shock absorption present within the bone. Though it is stiff and uh, tough, it is strong, despite the fact it is still malleable. You could see that bone can move in response to function. It is also light because of the heterogeneity that is found within that bone. So you could see that this bone is really a dynamic organ that responds to stimulus. And we also have heard about disuse atrophy. So active remodeling is always going to be there. And just like you would see the highways getting beat up with cars, a load bearing bone is very much like a highway. You have cars running over it in the same fashion. Every time our bone is being subjected to trauma, it automatically starts to heal. And this is a process which doesn't manifest itself in a major way because these micro cracks tend to heal by itself. The repair process is continuous. And when we look at the crack propagation, these micro cracks are resisted. The uh, cracks will stimulate a RAP, which is regional accelerator phenomenon. And then there's going to be a burst of activity with the expression of the uh, osteoclast, which will in turn release BMPs and create osteoblastic remodeling. And this is going to be continuous. And uh, if you look at this video, if the video could be played by our uh, organizers, uh, you will see that the crap propagation would generally be on, and uh, this is going to be resisted eventually through a mechanism that will be interrupted with subsequent bone healing. So this is not going to be propagated continuously, otherwise we will be suffering fractures all day long. So are these cracks a necessary evil? When we look at the dissipation of the uh, force to the surrounding bone, it contributes to some amount of remodeling. So that burst of activity stimulated by the fracture is needed for us to have healthy bones. So the bone turnover and the physiological uh, necessity to preserve the bone quality is something that's innate within bone. And this equilibrium or homeostasis as we describe it, could be impaired with bisphosphonate treatment. And we'll be talking about the various impact on bisphosphonate. You talked, uh, Jim already referred to the scientific basis of how these drugs act. Now let's look at the clinical impact of what we're seeing. The early reports of osteonecrosis of the jaw was quite evident. And now that is biological failure of bone where the drug is interfering with the osteoclastic ability to resolve bone and also to uh, have some maturation. What we are seeing with dental implants is a biomechanical failure of bone. So this is probably something very similar to the atypical fracture of the femur. You saw Dr. Schneider's report on spontaneous fracture. Perhaps dental implants could also be uh, subjected to this kind of a trauma. So leading to atypical dental implants, fracture of dental implants. 
what about patients who take anti-soft medications? This is a patient who came to our practice and this patient was a healthy female, um, 48 years old. She's been a dentist for 10 years. So she presented for dental implants. I placed these implants in 2003, almost 18 years ago. And she was 48 and she was taking Zoloft, no other significant contributory medical condition. She received, she received six implants, no grafts were performed, and uh, the case was restored with a hybrid prosthesis. She was concerned about her general health. She was getting into that menopausal stage, and uh, she went to a physician who did a DEXA scan and found her to be in the range of minus one to minus two. She, she was immediately placed on 35 milligrams of Fosamax. Uh, the hope at that point was we could probably arrest the progression of osteopenia into osteoporosis. So the introduction of Fosamax was an effort to prevent osteoporosis was the theoretical basis in which she was prescribed these medications. She was taking this continuously for five years. From 2004, she was taking for the next five years. In the interim, she came after three years for a follow-up. This was the post-operative radiograph where you can see the bone levels are not too bad. Um, she underwent routine prophylaxis. Uh, the bridge was removed, the implants were evaluated, and she went on going about her activities. So sometime in 2009, this is about five years into the treatment, she had another DEXA scan performed by her physician. They found no change at all in her osteopenic condition. So the physician automatically placed it on double the dosage to 70 milligrams of Fosamax. Um, the patient said, you know, maybe it is okay to have this dosage increased, but she was hearing these reports in the background. You saw the Good Morning America, you saw these NPR news, so she was very concerned. She stopped it on her own. She said, why should I take this continuously if the drug is not doing anything to me? So around 2010, she comes back with the complaint that something doesn't feel right. Uh, she does not feel the same way as she did. Implants don't feel firm. Uh, of course, she is not a stickler for maintaining her oral hygiene, so she comes back for a follow-up. This is about seven years into treatment. And uh, we took a, a clinical image, and then a radiograph was performed. This is the panoramic film. This kind of a circumferential bone loss I had not seen before. Uh, we had seen periimplantitis, uh, surfaces modified. We had HA coatings, which had uh, preimplantitis leading to a saucer-shaped effect. But this kind of a circumferential uh, bone loss was something that I had not seen before, nor was it reported earlier in literature. So the implants were um, basically looked at from a uh, uh, pathophysiological standpoint. And uh, we, uh, I, would, I didn't know what would be the protocol to treat these cases. So I ended up removing these implants and it did not take much effort at all. Uh, all I had to do was unscrew one of the implants which seemed to be stable and the entire assembly came off. Um, the the uh, unique feature of, these, of this case was that there was no presence of purulence. The patient didn't have any pain there was no exudate, nor was there any kind of inflammation. So this kind of an aseptic osteolysis of the uh, bone surrounding the dental implant was, was kind of baffling to me, and I really didn't have an idea as to how to treat these cases. You can cure it, but would grafting be the right approach? When the bone itself did not have the osteoclast to resorb its own self, how would this resorb an allergenic bone graft? So I ended up using bone mineral matrix, uh, bone putty, to just fill in the void and follow it up for three more months. So it prompted us to come up with this paper. This paper compared the failure of dental implants to the atypical fractures in long bone. And this publication in uh, Foro 
and the subsequent publication, one of the chapters, attracted attention, and we kept following up these cases. One more case came along. I bring this case up because I thought uh, maybe it had to do with the unique surface features because uh, we always had this problem with HA-coded implants. The implants that I took out earlier were RBM-coded implants, which is resorbable blast media. It's not a coding, it was a deletion process. And these implants were smooth machine surfaces um, performed about 18 years ago in NYU. So this patient comes along and she was complaining of irritation and bleeding around these endo implants. The moment I saw this picture, I knew what I was looking at. And she's been taking bisphosphonate, 70 milligrams for seven years continuously. The same pathognomonic signs were evident in this case as well. The moment I saw the radiograph, I knew what I was looking at, and it didn't take much effort to remove these implants. And you can see the circumferential bone loss, the coating of the tartar and the plaque in the absence of exudate or any kind of symptoms. So we uh, removed these implants and then I uh, uh, debrided, placed the same matrix and then used them as provisionals till we could come up with a definitive plan. Following up with this case, I would like to have one more case presentation, which I believe Dr. Rutkowski is going to uh, continue with his exposure of uh, implant failures. Over to you, Jim. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. The, um, the cases that uh, uh, Dr. Ayer presented to you were endosseous implants. This case that I'm going to present to you deals with a patient that had a universal subperiosteal implant. They had anterior teeth, but the posterior teeth were restored with a subperiosteal implant. The patient was a female age 75. The mandibular posterior uh, dentistures were restored with a universal subperiosteal implant in 1987. Uh, she started to take a lindronate 70 milligrams every week in 2001. So there were 14 years when we did not have any bisphosphonates. There was a comorbidity in this patient in that she was smoking one pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years. She began smoking the cigarettes. She'd been a smoker before she ever had the subperiosteal implant placed. But then when she decided she was going to get uh, the posterior teeth restored with dental implants, then she stopped smoking. And she did not smoke for two years and everything was fine. She started smoking in 1989. And even though that was a comorbidity that we do not like with implants, particularly subperiosteal implants, the smoking did not affect the implant. Um, she began taking uh, the, the um, Alindronate, 70 milligrams a week in 2001. And so six years later, portions of the implant framework became exposed with the subperiosteal, the framework underneath the gingival tissues portions of the framework became exposed. In 2009, 22-year time point developed an exposed bone with additional framework exposure and chronic infection. So now we have the, everything was fine until we got seven years into the bisphosphonate therapy, despite having the comorbidity of smoking. But now we have exposed bone, we have exposed framework. The implant is uh, 22 years old and now needs to be removed. So we removed that implant and we removed it on May 18th, 2009. And she returns three weeks later, June 8th, and we have exposed bone. That exposed bone does not heal. It goes beyond six weeks. So now it gets a diagnosis of chronic osteonecrosis of the jaw. And here it's medication related. So it's mirage. We can call it bronze because it was bisphosphonate. And August 12th, this is what she looks like. The left side is healing for us, but the right side where she holds the cigarette is not healing. And she spontaneously lost teeth numbers 26 and 27. So now we are three months post-implant surgery removal, still not healed. Now we are in September, the end of it, the 30th of it, of and now you can see she's on chlorhexidine rinse, and that's the staining you see in the bone. Left side where the smoking isn't is healing, but the right side where the smoking occurs is not healing. Patient is still smoking in spite of being asked to stop smoking. 
She comes in October 18th. This is six months following the initial surgery. She said, I was on the floor playing with my grandson. He raised his head, he hit my jaw, and I heard a snap. And what we have here is the jawbone, and you can see it's necrotic. There are no living cells. There is bone, but there are no living cells. You can see where the inferior alveolar nerve and artery used to be, that is all completely gone. This is a photo with it cleaned up. This is the way she came in, and there's extra data around it. This is actinomyces, which is one of the components of osteonecrosis of the jaw. So a hemisection is performed on her mandible, and here she is post-surgery on November 4th. But 10 days post-op, we now have a hot spot, a sign of infection. And that infection is there, and it's real. She's lost half her job. Now she's still smoking in spite of being asked. So we not only do we have the bisphosphonates, but we have a second comorbidity that has made it worse for us. And when we look inside the mouth, there's a, there's a radiograph showing the, uh, the framework for the hemisexual of the mandible and the titanium rods. And November 2nd, 2010, a year later, still not completely healed, there's a little bit of exposed bone. The bone graft that was done is completely gone. And that's where we are. This is two years later, still not completely healed. She finally did stop smoking uh, for us. And this is the best healing that we could get. Now, that patient had three fractures, spontaneous fractures of the spine. She had a spontaneous fracture of the subtracanor of her femur, and she ended up suffering renal disease from micro particles that are relieved from the inside of the, the blood vessels induced by bisphosphonates as well. And unfortunately, the patient ended up dying shortly after that. So these drugs, they are very beneficial. We need to consider them. But they do have a big impact on the patient's overall health if taken too long. And they certainly do have an effect on us in an implant dentistry if a patient is taking these medications, in particular for too long. So, Dr. Ira, back to you. Thank you, Jim. So, this is the classic seesaw pattern that we see with bone remodeling. You have uh, bone formation and bone resorption maintaining a state of equilibrium. So you have um, bone cells that are causing the resorption, and then you have the bone cells that are causing the bone formation. So this is equilibrium that's established where the bone is kept healthy. This equation tends to change where we have an incidence of osteoporosis. We see an increased rate of resorption and not an equivalent rate of bone formation. So what we tend to do is try to stop the rate of resorption. And by intervening with bisphosphonates, the equation becomes like this. You have lower rate of resorption and you have a lower rate of bone formation. So in the event there is a fracture, we're gonna have trouble trying to get that bone to heal. So what are the benefits of bisphosphonate therapy and how much is too much. Jim, you would be the best one to address that. Thank you. We do not know what is the ideal endpoint for treating a patient on bisphosphonates or monoclonal antibodies. And, and, and unfortunately, I cannot give you a definitive answer today to that. But we know that things become um, possible complications become possible when these patients have been taking these drugs for probably two and a half years. Some people believe that it is out five years. It depends on how, what was the bone turnover going on in the jaw as to where these drugs went and inhibited the osteoplastic activity. But we do know that once the bisphosphonate concentration in the bone reaches a 10 to the minus 10th to a 10 to the minus fifth molar concentration, apoptosis of the living cells in the bone takes place. So how safe are they? They're probably very safe short-term, but long-term, not safe at all. 
And we have to also be evaluating what are comorbidities, such as smoking, diabetes, uh, patients taking uh, chronic glucocorticosteroids that interfere with angiogenesis. These things can become problematic for us. So some clinicians believe that bisphosphonates are safe for prolonged consumptions. I've had discussions with physicians that say, this is not an issue whatsoever. Now, maybe their patients aren't taking them properly. Maybe they're taking them with food in their stomach. If they are, they never have these problems because they never absorb the drug. Other medical clinicians believe bisphosphonates are safe, are not safe for prolonged consumption. And even osteopenic patients who do not benefit from bisphosphonate therapy are being placed on bisphosphonate treatment because of the misconceptions or the doses prescribed are higher than initiated. If a patient does have osteopenia, and if they do decide to give them bisphosphonates, Fosamex, it should be 35 milligrams a week and not 70. So there is a medical paradigm here. Benefits of bisphosphonate therapy is such as fracture risk, reduction demonstrated for taking the drugs for three to five years, agreed upon. No difference in fracture uh, protection between patients treated with bisphosphonates for five years or 10 years and who discontinued the use for five years. Agreeable. And recent evidence demonstrated an increased risk for spontaneous atypical fractures that may be devastating. Dr. Iyer? Thank you, Jim. So this, again, is our equilibrium being established. We do have a physiologic remodeling response to function. So when there's trauma, we know that there is going to be a... Uh, activation of the osteoclast, a period of quiescence, and then there's a period of bone formation. So this remodeling is taking place as a cyclical phenomenon. What will happen, uh, that is necessary for maintenance of osteointegration. That bone around the implant is going to be healthy following the placement, it's not static as we know. Uh, within first four months, you're gonna see a state of uh, remodeling, which again, is going to be continuous throughout the life of that implant while it's surviving. The process of remodeling could be interrupted. And then you have suboptimal remodeling response. You've seen this as vitamin D deficiencies, and now you're seeing a premature failure of osteointegration with these medications. So when the demand for remodeling is there, then you have the cyclical loading causing a continuous fracture and micro cracks around the length of the implant. We know that 80% of the load is transmitted to the crestal 20%. So when the first region of the bone is lost through micro cracks along the crest, the subsequent area is going to receive the next load, but there is not enough time for that cracked bone to remodel and heal. So that crack propagation is going to be uh, transferred throughout the entire length of the implant. So that normal load will be compounded and that could lead to premature failure of acid integration or it could also lead to failure of an integrated implant. The cases that we see in the anterior mandible, we still don't know what's the quality of bone that's going to be uh, impacted upon, but we've seen these cases more so in the mandible than in the maxilla, probably because of the quality of bone, the density of the bone. We also see an increasing incidence of osteomyelitis in the mandible as opposed to the maxilla. Most of the cases that have been reported in my practice, they all appear in the mandible. So when the suboptimal remodeling response leads to this kind of a catastrophic failure, we could draw the inference that it is perhaps akin to a typical fracture of the hips and long bones, because these are spontaneous fractures. So it's also possible that a functioning dental implant could also be subjected to spontaneous fractures when there is bisphosphonates in the system. So the reality of that is that the catastrophic failures, which is very similar to what we see as atypical fractures is being investigated by the FDA. Uh, patients with dental implants who are currently receiving uh, or being replaced or being placed on long-term bisphosphonate treatment require interdisciplinary care. So it's not enough that we just 
get a medical history and we find that the patient had some risk positive in the past, we need to be a little more diligent in engaging the physician and engaging the orthopedic surgeon and engaging with a team that knows exactly what's going on with our patients. The consensus is something that I would leave to Jim. Jim, what's your take on this? Okay, thank you. Well, the, the literature uh, shows that patients taking bisphosphonates or monoclonal antibodies, they have a minimal risk of grunge, medicine-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, a minimal risk of less than 0.01%. But that's taking all the patients that take these drugs and putting them in the denominator. Then the numerator is the patients that have a problem. What that denominator should really be made up is the number of patients that take the drug and have an inciting incident, have a tooth removed, have an incision made of the gingival tissue, have the bone exposed in, in the surgical procedure or trauma to that tissue. That's what should really be in there. And those studies indicate the frequency of it is much higher. Now, admittedly, there is still, you know, that, that the, the, the number is probably less than 6% of the patients that take these medications and have a surgical procedure done develop osteonecrosis of the jaw. All the population is less than 0.01%. It is dose dependent, it is comorbidity dependent. What else is going on with that patient? The prognosis of implant-based patient rehabilitation is believed to be unchanged by some people because it is only 0.01% overall the entire population. But is that true when we look at the people that take the drug and have the procedure done? Bisphosphonates do not alter implant success in the short term because you're just screwing it into the, the bone. You just have the natural qualities of the bone and the threads of the implant holding it. But does it ever really truly osteointegrate long term? And if it doesn't osteointegrate, if that bone is not vital, then all the things that Dr. Ira were talking about, that load and the microfractures, and that bone just deteriorates all around that dental implant. So there's lots of studies that have been done. The problem is that these studies only look out three to five years. And that is an issue for us as we go through what we're trying to discern here. What is happening long term? And that is the, can, the, the, the big question for us. Can bisphosphate therapy impair the long term prognosis of successfully osteoporotic dental implants? So you've got the patient who got the implants, they weren't on the drugs, it osteointegrated, now they go on these drugs. Do those implants stay osteointegrated? Does that bone stay vital around those implants there? The other group of drugs, we spent a lot of time talking about bisphosphonates, and we made references to monoclonal antibodies, but monoclonal antibodies such as Prolia, they have an instance of ONJ following similar, being similar to that of bisphosphonate therapy. The denosinac is an injection that patients usually take twice a year subcutaneously. And the prevention of skeletal related events in bone metastasis of solid tumors is one of the indications for it. So we find these drugs, denosumab, monoclonal antibodies, being used in cancer patients, but they're also used to treat the osteoporotic patient. The FDA requires, we've learned something from these drugs, anti-resorptive drugs, that the FDA requires a special labeling on denosumab now, and that is ONJ, which can occur spontaneously, is generally associated with tooth extraction and or local infection with delayed healing and has been reported in patients receiving prolia. An oral exam should be performed by the prescriber prior to the initiation of prolia. The dental examination uh, with appropriate preventive dentistry should be considered prior to treatment in patients with risk factors for ONJ. Good oral hygiene practice should be maintained during treatment with prolia. Goes on to say, for patients requiring invasive dental procedures, clinical judgment should be guide the management plan of each patient. Patients who are suspected of having or who developed ONJ should receive a thorough examination and, and uh, receive care by a dentist or an oral surgeon. All surgical procedures should be performed before initiating monoclonal antibody therapy, and it should be true with bisphosphonates as well. 
get the surgical procedures out of the way, get the hygiene excellent, cleanings every three months, whether they have implants or not. You got to keep the inflammation down, the levels in their lutein IL-6 to a minimum. And then if those patients do have an occasion where they need to have surgery, we find those that have excellent hygiene, dental flossing daily, electric toothbrush use, and water irrigation done on a daily basis, we reduced in our practice and the literature supports the instance of ONJ following a surgical procedure by 76%. So gingival inflammation is a big comorbidity. Dr. Ira has a case with denosumab here. Thank you, Jim. So just then we were trying to get over all the complications with bisphosphonates. Then this case comes along and it's really uh, heart-wrenching to see some of these cases come back. You want to do your best. You have these successful cases going on and, uh, you know, unfortunate events take place in patients' lives. Here's a patient of mine that had placed implants in 2005. It was a full mouth reconstruction, FP1 prosthesis for the maxilla, hybrid for the mandible, porcelain fused to metal restorations. Um, good case, very lovely lady. She comes in routinely for her uh, maintenance appointments. And uh, somewhere around 2015, this was the smile before, uh, you know, post-op. And then we kept taking radiographs for a recare. And you can see the exquisite bone levels um, without any platform switch, without much of a fancy connection. This was a traditional non-engaging hybrid restorations with adequate room for uh, oral hygiene and maintenance. So sometime in 2014, about uh, nine to 10 years into her uh, treatment, uh, she was developed, she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And she was on um, uh, chemotherapy, she had mastectomy, uh, the uh, patient was not operable. Uh, she presented with this kind of a gingival inflammation. And this time she was given denosumab. Uh, right away, I knew I'm dealing with another ominous situation here. Uh, we take a radiograph, and then there it is. Uh, very similar to what I was seeing with the bisphosphate is what I'm seeing with denosumab, especially, again, in the mandible, anterior mandible, circumferential bone loss. Um, there is no cement, so you cannot blame it on uh, cement periplantitis. You cannot blame it on overload because this has been functioning well for the past 10 years, and uh, we had to defer the definitive treatment. So uh, in 2016, I uh, removed these implants. Again, the uh, clinical presentation is identical to what I saw with the bisphosphonate cases. So uh, my current practice involves thorough medical history. When I place my implants, I always tell them, if anything changes with the medical history, the physician probably should be consulting with us to uh, look at what we have done and what things can be modified to be able to mitigate the effects of the uh, uh, adverse impact on dental implants by these medications. So these implants were removed, are divided. I followed the same protocol I did. Uh, this time I'm using uh, an organic bone substitutes, uh, mostly as fillers, and then we were able to put the case back into uh, function. Um, Jim had already mentioned about the fact that these medications don't stay in the system, and I'm sure he is going to be elaborating more on the impact of uh, these anti-resorptive agents, the newer anti-resorptive agents, and uh, its impact on bone turnover. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. The, 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 the issue with these, we thought was that the bisphosphonates stayed in the bone so long. And that probably is an issue with the bisphosphonates. But the issue with both of them, the monoclonal antibodies and the bisphosphonates, is that you interfere with the bone remodeling. That is the problem. And the bone, you interfere with the bone remodeling on a long-term basis. Now you end up with dead bone. Dead bone cannot remodel. So when you put the stresses on your dental implants with the chewing forces and whatnot, that bone cannot remodel. It does not stay vital. And now it becomes non-vital and simply um, becomes a major problem for us there. So what does the literature say? We're, we're running low on our time here. But they're in the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, the Journal of Oral Implantology, published a paper in 2021, April issue, 
the success rate and safety of dental implantology in patients treated with anti-resorptive medications, a systematic review. And the purpose was to evaluate whether dental implants placed in implants and patients on anti-resorptive medication have an increased failure rate and whether the implant placement or the implant existence are risk factors for uh, Mirage medication related. But because of the small number of studies that have been done, most of which were characterized by a low level of quality, it cannot be established that the use of anti-resorptive medications affected dental implant survival rates. But let's get a feel for what's going on here and what we know. The risk of mirage as an early or late complication is also not well established. It has not been elucidated. Therefore, successful dental implant procedures in patients receiving anti-resorptive medications might be possible, but more studies need to be carried out for the future to verify this. And, and, and so that's why I'm going to encourage you to download that consent form that we have put up on the website for you that you can have your patients sign and go over with them so they understand the risk, so there's no surprises. I hope it doesn't occur. Most likely it will not occur. But just as most likely you're not going to have a catastrophic event with your home or your office building, you're probably not going to have a fire. You probably are not going to or a flood, but yet you will buy insurance in the event that those things occur. I'm going to encourage you to sign, get that consent form signed so you do not have difficulties with it. Um, uh, can somebody advance the slide? I'm sorry, it did not advance for me. Uh, an interesting fact is that the 138 patients included in this group of studies, 91 developed mirage greater than six months after the dental implant placement. So the number of early on failures, they were there, but not to the degree that they were after they'd been on the medications for six months or longer. The safety of dental implantology in patients under anti-resorptive medication is a matter of great significance as dental implants can improve the quality of life in patients with anti-resorptive therapy, analogous to patients without anti-resorptive therapy. Implants help, but if they develop mirage, then it does interfere with the quality of life of that uh, patient. So we, are, we, 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 we want to do everything we can to prevent that from occurring for us. And so uh, the Amos position paper in 2014 suggests that a drug holiday is prudent approach for patients with extended exposure history, and they said greater than four years. That is somewhat arbitrary. I personally believe that it should be at two and a half years. Uh, but we should look at bone turnover markers for these patients. And again, advance, please. The American Dental Association uh, states that there's not enough evidence to recommend a holiday from the anti-resorptive drugs. And there is a risk if you take the patients off these drugs. But do a consultation with a physician. I truly believe that we're going to get bone turnover markers, which I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. And if those numbers are not where they should be, you should take a drug holiday. So we're not just looking at an arbitrary time span, but we're actually looking at some scientific evidence. Um, it is necessary to compare the benefits of the drug holiday, the implant placement versus the risk. If it's more than two and a half years, get these studies that we're going to talk about here. They also say post-surgically that you should use chlorhexidine mouthwashes. They appear to be effective in reducing the inflammation and biofilm during these early periods. And I am a big believer in antibiotic prophylaxis, one dose prior to surgery. But in these patients, a study in 2014 found that if you would continue the antibiotic coverage for seven to 10 days, there was a reduced incidence of implant failure by 66%. So in these patients, it may be beneficial not only to do a dose preoperatively one hour prior to your surgery, but then continue those antibiotics for seven to 10 days, just in these patients, as you would in immunocompromised patients. Normally, we say only one dose preoperatively. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide again, please. So one can use PRP 
platelet concentrates and PRF, when they do their surgeries, there's evidence in the literature to show that helps with the healing when you do surgery in these patients. Next slide, please. And you must use exquisite treatment planning for these patients and know exactly what you're up against. And next slide, please. So you need to have excellent oral hygiene, daily flossing, two minute brushing with an electric toothbrush and water irrigation. That is imperative for you, that's important. That is the, the most important thing for you. So a summary of the patients taking our entire uh, resort to medications, determine the reason for the patient taking it. Is it for cancer? Is it for osteopenia osteoporosis? Next slide, please. Determine the dosage, determine the route of administration, and determine the length of time they've taken it. And next slide, please. If the medication is an oral bisphosphate, ask the patient, how did they take it? If they tell you they took it with food, you probably don't have a problem at all because they never absorbed it. If they took it on an empty stomach like they should, now you may have an increased risk. Next slide, please. So we believe that prior to doing the surgery, if they've been on the medications for two and a half years or more, that you should get a serum CTX. That is going to tell you that the universal osteoclast activity and a serum BSAP, bone specific alkaline phosphate, that's going to tell you the osteoblast activity. If the CTX is less than 100, you have a high risk. And the next slide, please. If the BSP, BSAP, the osteoblast determinant, we like that between 7.9 and 29, regardless of the age of the patient, that tells us that they are laying bone down successfully. So we have slides here with the guidelines for treating them. There's about another three or four slides here, which unfortunately we do not have the time for, but uh, you do have the slides and it's going to tell you how to treat the patient that's been on these medications for a specific period of time. Do they take other medications that inhibit angiogenesis for you? The key is, when you have these patients, proceed with passion. Thank you very much.